so welcome um, everyone to this panel on extreme climate risks. What are the worst case scenarios? The panel is part of Cambridge Zero's Climate Change Festival 2021, and we'd like to thank Cambridge Zero and the organisers for their work in setting up this festival and the lead up to COP26. I'm Catherine Arnold, um, the chair of the panel today and the master of St Edmund's College. The topic for today is simple. Just how bad could climate change get? What are the worst cases, not just in the rate and magnitude of global warming, but also in the overall consequences? Could climate change result in a global catastrophe or even more speculatively, human extinction? Groups such as Extinction Rebellion have framed the climate crisis as a risk to billions of lives. But what does the science say? Do we have compelling reasons to think this could be the case? Such questions may seem confronting, but the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of the importance of considering high impact, low probability risks. As a former diplomat, I'm used to discussions around 1.5 degrees or two degrees. The science there is stark, the diplomacy remains often a challenge, but could it be worse? And why don't we talk about that more regularly? Today, we have a panel of experts across climate science and policy to help answer these questions. I'm going to give each panelist approximately 10 minutes to present, followed by roughly an hour for questions and answers. Please do submit questions throughout the event. Our speakers today are Professor Tim Lenton. Tim is a professor at Exeter University and director of the Global Systems Institute. He's the author of multiple books and highlights cited articles on the future and history of the Earth system. Tim is particularly known for his work identifying tipping elements in the climate system, which won the Times Higher Education Award for Research Project of the Year 2008. He's a fellow of the Linnaean Society, Geological Society, and the Royal Society of Biology. Welcome, Tim. I also welcome today Dr. Goodwin Gibbons. Goodwin is a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University, where she studies catastrophic climate change scenarios. She holds a doctorate in climatology from Imperial College London, in which she focused on stability properties and thermodynamic behavior of the climate system. In 2017, she won the Faculty of Natural Sciences Prize for Excellence for Teaching and Learning. Welcome, Goodwin. And then Dr. Luke Kemp, uh, who has organized today's panel and to which I express particular gratitude for that. Luke is a research associate at the Center of the Study for Existential Risk at Cambridge University, as well as a David McKay research affiliate with Darwin College and Cambridge Zero. He has advised the Australian Parliament on ratifying the 2015 Paris Agreement and holds a PhD from the, the Australian National University, where he lectured in climate science and policy. Luke is currently writing a book for Penguin, Viking Books on societal collapse and transformation. Welcome to all our panel. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Tim Nanton. Thank you, Catherine. OK, let's share screen and get this what could be a rather bleak hour and a half underway. Um, I have to say that usually I give talks on positive tipping points <laughs> these days because this is going to be um, tough listening uh, to warn you. Anyway, I'm going to start with the this little toy model of a, a complex system being pushed to and past a tipping point and uh, just so we can get our eye in. But you know, many complex systems have alternative stable states, like societies can be at peace or in conflict. And as we'll see, bits of the Earth system can be in very different states. And perhaps under um, forcing, like global temperature rise, we might, as we'll see, pass a range of tipping points, both in um, bits of the natural climate system and in our complex human systems. And those are surely one source of concern around worst case scenarios. So before we get to the climate tipping points, um, it's kind of worth internalizing the knowledge that uh, if we carry on where we're going and current policy would take us globally to about 2.9 degrees C of warming, so three degrees C of warming, give or take, then uh, we're going to see an extraordinary expansion of climates that hardly anybody experiences today. So I'm just showing this in terms of temperature. I'm showing you in the black spots 
places which have a mean annual temperature of 29 degrees C or above today, a few spots in the Sahara basically, Mecca, one city, is in that black area. But in a three degree C warmer world, these hot regions expand considerably to some of the most densely populated parts of the planet. Parts of the planet, like the Indian subcontinent, where already we're seeing combined hot and humid extremes that reach wet bulb temperatures, as they're called, equivalent to body temperature that become potentially fatal to all mammal life, let alone human life. So in simple terms, um, if we do a calculation of in this three degrees sea warmer world with a UN central population projection, how many people are going to be experiencing this pretty unprecedented hot climates? We come up with a number um, around or greater than three billion people. I cannot avoid concluding from that that we are going to be looking at huge um, huge movements of people across the planet because I don't honestly believe everybody is going to be rich enough um, or perhaps foolish enough to try and stay in in situ and cope with what can become intolerable climate extremes. So that, in my view, is probably, sadly, um, a path to cascading social breakdown, but we can come back to that in the discussion. Now let's move to the fact that we could destabilize fundamentally the climate system itself. So yeah, I, I mean, over 10 years ago, we identified a bunch of parts of the climate system that could be pushed past the tipping point by human activities, global warming this century. Here's one version of my map with think, you know, systems involving ice melting in blue, circulation change of the ocean or the atmosphere or the two of them coupled together in red or loss of major biomes in green. Um, as we see, these are not uh, uncoupled things. Each has their own tipping points, but, but in tipping one can influence another. First, we need to ask ourselves something about how likely they are and then something about their magnitudes. On the likelihood of these different tipping points, well, the risk assessment looks bleak. Basically, 20 years ago, we thought it would take four or five degrees of global warming to be a sort of significant probability of passing some damaging climate tipping points. Now, um, the recent IPCC special reports converge on the view that I would share that we're already in the danger zone. Basically, we're at about 1.1 degrees C of global warming, and we're already uh, in a situation where we can't rule out, we've passed a couple of ice sheet tipping points and made long-term commitments to multi-meter sea level rise. And you're already in the Paris Agreement range of warming one and a half to two degrees C, we're at the point where you'd almost say it was likely we'll pass some climate tipping points. And yes, there's plenty of empirical evidence to suggest I'm not, um, you know, I'm not being a gratuitous alarmist here. We see accelerating change in the wrong direction in several of the previously identified tipping elements. And some of those changes are highlighted in the, the black boxes there. But we also see the empirical evidence that just, just like the organs of the human body, the elements of the Earth system causally couple together. And if you, if you tip one, you're gonna have consequences for others. Most notably, we know the Arctic's warming up two or three times as fast as the global average because of the retreat of the sea ice exposing a dark ocean that absorbs far more sunlight. We know that Arctic warming is accelerating the melt of the Greenland ice sheet. It's also causing much more rainfall in the Arctic. That freshens up the surface of the North Atlantic Ocean and contributes to weak, an observed weakening of the great overturning circulation of the Atlantic Ocean, which kind of drags heat at the surface from the southern hemisphere up to the northern hemisphere, gives us a nice equable climate in Western Europe, but also sets the position of a great band of rainfall all the way around the tropics. So as it weakens, that band of rainfall heads south, and that effectively translates into disrupting the monsoons in the Amazon, West Africa, and India, and it leaves heat behind in the Southern Ocean, which can go to work threatening the ice sheets there. Which, which in West Antarctica is the place we already see the most compelling evidence that we're potentially past the tipping point and might have committed to more than a metre of sea level rise just from West Antarctica alone. So if those things interact and they inter interact like the proverbial dominoes uh, arrayed 
upright, uh, we could get, in the worst case scenario, the domino dynamics. You tip one thing and then it triggers feedbacks that tip another and you, we just lose control of the situation, which is what the, that's the, the biggest risk in terms of fundamentally shifting the whole nature and state of the climate system potentially into what we called hothouse earth, a, a linguistic reference to some past climates that haven't been seen for about 40 or 50 million years and that look completely different. Well, we don't want to go there. We want to go to stabilised earth, but, but we're here to talk about the biggest risks. So there's one of them. Uh, we don't need things to get that bad, though, for, I think, for, 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 for this to be an existential threat. And I'm just going to finish by showing you what happens if you have uh, a global warming of, say, two and a half degrees, see a bit less than what we should expect on current policies, but we're unlucky and we tip a collapse of that Atlantic Ocean circulation. Well, it does some extraordinary things like it, it, it cools, uh, it manages to override the warming and cool the North Atlantic region, giving us ice, sort of little ice age conditions. But the, the really epic thing is it does a profound amount of drying over Europe and a profound drying in, this, in the tropics where it shifts that band of rainfall south. So it would effectively collapse the monsoons in West Africa and India. And you see it get a lot wetter down here over the ocean and no one there to benefit from it really. You can do simple things, you can then put that through a model of suitability of the th of three major staple crops, wheat, maize and rice, and you can look at the combined effects of global warming on its own or this particular climate tipping point. And uh, purple means loss in suitable area for growing crop, green means gain. The situation's kind of neutral for rice, but I'm afraid for wheat and maize, it's a double whammy. You get a significant decline in suitable growing area just from the global warming signal, and the tipping point uh, amplifies that, if you like, and takes out yet more area, so that we would see this, this double whammy scenario, you more than half the suitable area for growing wheat or for growing maize. Um, the simple conclusion would be there's a climate security and food security crisis right there. And just to finish up, if you think this is a little, you know, too global, wonder what's going in the U going to happen to the UK. If you want to be parochial about it, we've also studied the same, roughly the same climate change, same climate tipping point scenario for the UK. We've got a detailed model in Exeter of econometric model of land use so we can do a detailed job of showing that the, the extraordinary drying that would happen with this climate tipping point would eliminate arable farming from the UK but I have to tell you that would be the least of our worries because we calculated how much of a water crisis it would cause uh, in the populous southeast of the country um, and it would be epic so that's more than enough uh, misery from me, but that hopefully gives you a flavour of some of the worst case scenarios. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Tim. And if I pass now to um, Dr. Goodwin Gibbons. Thank you, Catherine. Um, well, thank you very much, Tim. That was quite the place to start. I liked how many pieces of examples we had from that. It's going to be quite helpful. Because what I wanted to do in um, my 10 minutes is step us back a bit and think a little bit about how we're framing this discussion of what is the worst case. Um, so I'm relatively new to studying this head on. I've been a climate scientist until recently. And moving into the philosophy department now, um, I'm thinking about what we're doing as scientists to get to the bottom of questions like these, which is not easy because as scientists, we have to answer scientific questions, questions that we can get solid answers to. So let's suppose we wanted to use the expertise we have to think about what are the worst case scenarios. Um, before I launch into it, I wanted to <laughs> reference this issue of positivity and negativity and hope. So normally we try and talk about climate change in a hopeful way. Um, I think talking about it like we're going to talk about it today in terms of the worst case scenarios is really powerful for helping us understand our moral duty and opportunity um, for future generations, basically. You know, if we pass off something bad without realizing it, it's, it's not something to be proud of, even if it feels like a hopeful situation. So um, as we're talking about this, let's sort of realize that thinking about it gives us opportunities to do something about it. Um, and then the other thing I want to emphasize is that we don't need this worst case scenario. I think you made this point very well, Tim. We don't need the worst case scenario to act, you know, 
even what's currently happening is basically bad enough. And so we'll talk about it, but um, you know, if we're not sure about some things here in the worst case scenario, we don't need to pause everything we're doing with climate change, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say before I launch in to some splitting up the question is, um, as a scientist, I think a lot about what questions are answerable and what questions are important. And those are not always the same ones. Um, so, you know, it might be easy. Some studies are easier to run than others. Um, and in this space, we don't really have the science we need and it's gonna be very hard to get the science we need. You know, We don't have complete models of the climate that can run out to the possible end of time. You know, It'd be really nice to have that. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're kind of, it's a bit of a sleuthing mission, I think, gathering as many lines of evidence as we can, um, which again, Tim's given us a really good sample of those to begin with. Um, and so, yeah, here we go into the puzzle. So, um, I thought it was quite useful when I was thinking about this to split out what the worst case scenario is into like four sources of worst, of worst cases, four sources of extreme um, extremes. So the four I'm gonna talk about is how bad it could be in terms of how much CO2 we emit. And then how bad, what's the worst case in terms of how the climate responds to a certain amount of CO2 emission because there's a worst case there as well. There's a third worst case, which is what's the worst case scenario of how badly humans respond to a certain amount of badness in the temperature response. And then I think there's even a fourth worst case that's interesting, which is what is the worst that can happen if humans try and fix something that's bad, which is, can be surprisingly bad as well. So I'll just go through them again with a bit more detail. So what's the worst case scenario of how much cumulative CO2 we could emit? So we have these targets in the Paris Agreement that would say we don't emit that much. Um, but at the moment, we're really in no sense on track to meeting those targets. So the, the UN GAP report just came out this morning, I think. Um, you guys might have seen it on the news. It basically shows that um, the plan that we have emits twice as much CO2 as we should um, to hit the targets that we had in mind. Um, and if you look at, if you, when you look at projections of fossil fuel emissions, it would even, even the scenarios that we draw up for um, worst case emission scenarios have us leveling off our emissions and reducing them to zero in 200 years, which may or may not be something we're capable of doing as a species. So I think the worst case scenario for how much cumulative CO2 we emit, we have to realize plausibly, unless we get to net zero soon, it can be worse than we're really ready to discuss. Um, one possible upper threshold might be the total amount of fossil fuels that we know to exist. Um, unfortunately, that number keeps increasing every year. And so even that isn't a firm upper bound. Um, and another point here to make is leaning into this pessimism, can we expect, expect the net zero if we did reach it to hold for 10,000 years? What if there's a rogue state? What if there's a war? Um, because CO2 stays in the atmosphere for so long, um, a net zero, it matters if this, the fossil fuels are ever emitted, not just if they're emitted before 2100. So I think worst case scenario of how much cumulative CO2 could be emitted, very bad. Um, one study that looked recently at um, 5,000 gigatons of CO2 being emitted um, estimated a temperature change of like between six and 10 degrees Celsius. So that's already huge. And that unfortunately wasn't taking into account the worst case scenario of how the climate might respond to a certain greenhouse gas emission. So um, what do we know about the climate's response? So the basic thing we know is that more CO2 makes it hotter. And there's a proportion, constant of proportionality that we work with, the climate sensitivity. And there's been a spread in our understanding of the climate sensitivity between about 1.5 and 4.5 degrees per doubling of CO2. The thing is, that um, the climate sensitivities distribution is probably fat tailed, we call it, which means that there is, there's more chance of it being high, but surprisingly high than there is of it being surprisingly low. And that's because it's an amplifying kind of system. So if you imagine, um, because you, if it gets warmer, it makes things happen, that makes it get even warmer. The chance of it running away to a high climate sensitivity, that distribution is skewed in that direction. Um, then the other issue that comes on with the climate's potential responses is tipping points, which I don't need to talk about in this panel. Um, but 
Uh, one of them that I will mention that Tim didn't mention yet is this recent, two years ago, we discovered a new tipping point, um, the stratocumulus cloud breakup. And what this is, is the idea that as CO2 sits in the atmosphere, which you know acts as a blanket in the atmosphere, it changes the radiative properties. And for clouds that rely on radiation um, to exist, which is the stratocumulus marine clouds that, co that cover like six and a half percent of the Earth's surface, if the radiation patterns change, those clouds might disappear and that might change the amount of sunlight that's absorbed by the planet. And that alone in this study, they thought maybe that could cause an extra eight degrees of warming. And that might occur with um, three times as much CO2 as we have in the atmosphere now, which could in a worst case, worst case emission scenario, a kind of plausible bad case emission scenario happen within a century. Um, so the climate is kind of, um, it's an unruly beast and there's no, there's no limit to the worst case scenario. Oh, that's not true. The worst case scenario of what the climate can do is a scary thing. And anticipating it is kind of like trying to anticipate an animal. We can't run experiments. Our best models are made of something entirely different. It's not like we even have like a mouse model, so to speak. Um, we have our climate models, which are good at what they're good at, but not good at everything. And the hints that we have from the paleoclimate record show ice ages happening when the solar radiation changes like minutely. So we have this example of in the climate, in the record, we have mass extinctions happening without really a sense of what the source could have been for a lot of them. We know that the climate, like Tim was saying, is very possible of finding dramatically different stable states than what it's in right now. So the worst case scenario of the climate response to not the worst case scenario of the cumulative CO2 is extreme. Um, and that's not even mentioning a runaway greenhouse effect, which may or may not be possible on earth, but could involve uh, feedback feedbacks even beyond the ones that I discussed. Okay, so just in case we're still feeling positive, let's discuss the worst case scenario of how badly the human system might react to climate change. So one thing that's striking about climate change as a stressor um, that makes it particularly scary is that it's a simultaneous disruption of everyone across the world in different ways. So COVID was like this. Um, COVID had the advantage of disrupting different people in similar ways, I would say. Um, to have droughts in some areas, floods in some areas, extreme weather events happening is quite a complicated issue. Um, to mention migration coming off the back of that, that seems like a really reasonable concern. Um, or, you know, water shortages in some areas causing political unrest within the countries. Um, we are really not peaceful creatures at the best of times. Um, and as I think Luke might touch on later, a lot of the times when we have been our most unpeaceful has been when there's been quite a slight change in our climate, like a small failing of a harvest or something. Um, and we are incredibly capable of pretty scary things. I mean, it's only within the past generation that we had the nuclear crisis is reaching really significant proportions. And um, yeah, I mean, a question I think maybe we should ask ourselves in, in addressing this aspect is, what's the most mild change that you can imagine to stabilizing society, the most mild climate change? And that, that to me kind of flips the question and I realize I could imagine society being destabilized by quite a small um, hiccup. Okay, so let's imagine society is getting destabilized and let's imagine we try and fix it. Could we even have a worst case scenario from the fixing? Um, and this is one that comes in when we talk about, some people talk about geoengineering, which is a loaded word because it includes both removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is direct air capture, which I want to separate. That's pretty simple because that just undoes what we've done. Um, but solar radiation management would be changing the sunshine um, in order to try and cool the planet down to undo what we're doing with climate change. The problem is that's probably not a direct undo. And it's a really political thing. So some countries will benefit from solar radiation management more than others. Um, and someone could do it as a rogue actor. And then also we have the system, which maybe in other ways we might try and change, but without fully understanding. And I'm actually surprisingly worried about what happens if we feel empowered to then start influencing our climate. Um, I think the general sense here I have is that the climate is the substrate on which we rely as a species. And it's a very, um, it's a very delicate one and it's a it's a very complicated one and uh, some the safest thing to do is to not mess with it for sure and when we mess with it 
we're really reliant on it. We're not very stable ourselves. It can change an awful lot. It's a really terrifying situation. Um, I think I've probably gone on for slightly more than 10 minutes. I have a few more things to say. Um, should I, sh Luke's giving me a hand. Keep going for now. Okay, I'll, I'll say a few more things because I've got them lined up. Um, so those are four ways that we could get a worst case scenario. I didn't even suggest combining the worst case from those four categories, right? What if we had worst case emissions with worst case tipping points and feedbacks with worst case human responses? Um, we were not very adaptive. We were not very peaceful as a species. Climate change could be an arbit like an ar the source of arbitrarily large damage. Um, another way to think about this is work backwards from what you value. Let's say we're thinking about the extinction of the human race. Um, or maybe we want to think about not the extinction, but just a long-term suffering, a kind of a scrooge that just stays around our society. Or maybe you don't want to just focus on humans, but you want to focus on um, like all life, the biodiversity loss. When we break it down that way, some of the things are definitely already an issue, the biodiversity loss, even with our current level of warming, which is definitely not what's going to happen in the long run, um, is, is definitely tragic things are happening there. Um, and so what I mean to say here is, though the extinction of humanity, for example, might be something that we think that we could get away with avoiding, maybe we're settling exoplanets or something, there are things that are very tragic, according to a lot of people's values that will happen before then. Um, and if we're thinking about something like the extinction, we also have to realize that the, um, the other forces that make society potentially humans that might cause humans to be struggling, um, those are gonna be, in, we're gonna be more vulnerable off the back of climate change. So I think I'll, I'll leave that point for Luke because I know that we've chatted about it offline. I think he'll manage that well. So, um, right. I think that kind of concludes the main thoughts I wanted to say. I think one more, one more point is, um, I've talked about, about worst case scenarios with um, climate change as a problem, but there are also worst case scenarios for solutions. So like if we cut off our usage of fossil fuels tomorrow and went cold turkey, that would, be, that would also be very hard. So we're really between a rock and a hard place, I would say, um, if we're thinking about worst case scenarios. And um, it's a bit like a war. I mean, one has to band together and do what it takes, which brings me back to the hope um, that thinking about this head on maybe gives us a bit more of a, um, a call to action. So um, thank you. Sorry to go a bit over and I'll pass back. Thank you very much, um, Goodwin. And now handing to Dr. Luke Kemp. Excellent, thank you, Catherine. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. So how bad could climate change get? It feels like my two eminent colleagues have been exceedingly and impressively depressing, but I'll see what I can do to up them. So this and the remarks I have here are based loosely upon some work I'm doing with Tim, Johan Rocksham and several others, which is trying to kind of address this question head on. I really love the way that Goody framed this in terms of those four questions. And similarly, I've actually always thought about this in four ways as well, but with just slightly different questions attached. For me, a lot of this is about both the magnitude of warming we can expect in the worst case scenario, which combines both the kind of anthropogenic emissions we can expect, the actual concentrations attributable to human emissions, the climate sensitivity, so what we expect the Earth system to react and what that leads to in terms of end concentrations, but also secondly, the rate of change, because obviously there's a huge difference between getting two degrees in the space of say, a hundred years versus two degrees in the space of a couple of decades. Thirdly is, as Goody mentioned as well, how societies react both through potentially things like geoengineering, but also in the short term, things like political change, conflict, etc. And I think the fourth one I tend to have, which is slightly different, is how does the overall Earth system respond? Because often we have this tendency to think about climate change and its risk assessment as just climate change, when in reality, we know it interacts with a whole kind of load and system of other planetary boundaries and how things like ocean acidification, biodiversity loss and collapse play out will obviously have huge ramifications for human societies as well. 
I'll now get into it. So we've already actually covered some of this. I think both Tim and Goody have mentioned some of the results we're talking about here, but there's good reasons to expect that we are going to potentially go above 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and it could potentially be far, far higher. So one study a few years ago put forward the kind of likely range of 2 to 4.9 degrees by 2100. The coupled model into comparison project CMIP6, which underpins the most recent assessment report, produced higher results than we usually have from models. This could be for a number of reasons, including kind of more refined treatment of cloud dynamics. A number of the higher results were eventually excluded because they weren't fitting to observation results. But nonetheless, we did end up with a kind of a pretty high level of climate sensitivity in AR6. So the six assessment report ends up both constraining the climate sensitivity, so the amount of warming we can expect if we double CO2 in the atmosphere. So it got constrained to roughly two to five degrees Celsius. That's the, the very likely range. The interesting thing was that essentially 1.5 degrees or anything below that was ruled out, but anything above five degrees and plus could not be ruled out. As Guzzi already mentioned, there has, have been some new mechanisms that have been discovered in recent years that have, such as the potential for a stratocumulus cloud breakup with temperatures of roughly six to eight degrees being added on top of the warming we already have. And overall, we do know that the, the risk of climate change is roughly fat tail. So work by, I think it was uh, Wagner and Weizmann a number of years ago, did some basic calculations and came up with the idea that if you have set 100 parts per million, which is a kind of middle of the road estimate for concentrations, you have a roughly 10% chance exceeding six degrees Celsius by the end of the century. What do we know so far? The answer is, somewhat very little. So this is based upon a piece of research I did with a number of colleagues uh, led by Florian Oregen at the University of Gießen, where essentially did text mining of IPCC reports to look at the mention of different degrees. And of course, this is a kind of imperfect proxy for whether they're kind of covering those degrees. But we also combined that with some literature sampling to verify results. And what we found was that we were essentially betting on the best case, that the vast majority of research that the IPCC covers, and the IPCC is supposed to be indicative of the state of research, is focused upon 1.5 to 2 degrees. When you look at, say, for example, a scenario of 700 parts per million, which again is this kind of middle of the, rain, middle of the road scenario, you end up with two thirds of the probability mass, the likelihood, being above 3 degrees Celsius but just around 10% of the mentions of temperature rise in the IPCC reports is for three degrees or above. The IPCC itself in AR5, it notes that there have been very few estimates of the aggregate impacts at three degrees or above. So overall, the topic seems to be neglected and understudied. And that's just looking at the question of the kind of biophysical side of things, so the rate of change and the amount of warming we can expect. Why should we worry about this? I think both Goody and Tim have already given you ample reasons for that. I'm just going to add a few more on top of it. So first of all, I think as Goody already mentioned, climate change has been implicated in mass extinction events in history. In history. There's been five big ones about the Phenozoic history of planet Earth, and the most recent evidence suggests that warming has been implicated in every single one of them. The worst of which was the Great Permian Dying, which was roughly 252 million years ago. And estimates vary, but it could have wiped out roughly 80 to 90 percent of the biosphere at the time. There was some work by a geologist by the name of Rothman, Daniel Rothman, and he's done a lot of work trying to calculate what's the carbon threshold for a mass extinction event. How much carbon do you need to have? And what's the rate of change necessary before you lock in place processes and feedbacks that are likely to lead to a mass extinction event? And this graph off to the side, figure four, shows the outcome of those were published back in, I think, 2017 or 2018. And as you can see, the, the kind of central red line here is his best estimate for the kind of the threshold effect for a mass extinction event. And the lines above and below, the dotted lines, are the kind of 50% um, certain intervals. And basically, pretty much every single one of the RCPs represent concentration pathways end up crossing that line and end up creating a potential for a mass extinction event. Uh, 
There's also just simply the fact that historically humans, whether we like it or not, have been very influenced by climate, if not actually adapted towards a very particular climate niche. So Tim mentioned the work of Zucci and others, which looked at the idea of a human climate niche, that when you look at things historically, roughly 80% of the population has been adapted to a kind of narrow climatic envelope of roughly 13 degrees, degrees mean annual average temperature. And when we stray from that even a little bit, it often has very large consequences. So there's a very large body of literature looking at how the rise and fall of empires and different polities and their transformation throughout history has often been tied to climate change. And this has notably been usually due to very, very small regional changes. So we're talking you know, one to two degrees variation at a regional level. So this is based upon a lot of different work, including people like uh, Harvey Weiss, who looks at mega droughts, as well as people like Eric Klein, who's looked at how the Bronze Age collapse in which a large number of interconnected societies in the Mediterranean collapse at the same time that we experienced cooling and drying in that region. What are the pathways that we can expect for climate change to have in order to reach a catastrophe? One is just the sum total of impacts. The compound hazards we expect from climate change eventually overwhelm that capacity. The much more likely, much more interesting one is systemic risk. That we have what are called risk cascades where the, a single hazard or risk has knock on effects which amplify or trigger other risks. And we see this with COVID-19, for instance. And this is something that's already happened when it comes to climate change. In 2010, there was a, a heat wave in Russia, which actually reduced cereal crop yields, leading to Russia to do an export ban on their cereals. And in turn, that actually led to a price shock on the global food market, which led in turns to a surge of uh, food bank usage in the UK, as well as actually contributed to the political turmoil that was seen in uh, Egypt that year. There's also potential for it to trigger other extreme risks such as nuclear warfare, warfare, or as Goody suggested, potentially a geoengineering experiment gone wrong. And I think a really interesting one we don't think about enough is latent risk. That if we have a warming which we can somehow adapt to or handle given kind of high levels of GDP and technology, but what happens if we have some kind of a collapse event? Say for instance, the wake of a nuclear war and suddenly six degrees of warming comes rushing back in after a nuclear winter. That's what I call latent risk, essentially. The, an underlying risk built into the system would potentially re-emerges eventually. And this could be triggered by anything, whether it's nuclear war or you know, even a zombie apocalypse. Cue from after, and we'll move on. So what do we need to know? I think I already partially covered this in the four questions, but if you're really trying to put it down to really kind of streamlined agenda of sorts, I'd say extremes, both in terms of magnitude and rate of warming, the long-term impacts, so thinking beyond 2100 and really thinking about these really big potential mechanisms that you see at play in mass extinction events, so things like ocean anoxia. Third is a more complex risk assessment, looking at risk cascades as well as risk responses, which is something the IPC is slowly moving towards. The most recent assessment report was the first time the IPCC actually started talking about risk responses, which is a, a good sign. And then moving on to kind of early warning signals, which is really about making things more useful in terms of responding to climate change. I should note that when it comes to both early warning signals and complex risk assessment, we really need to think about under what scenarios the climate change occurring. Because there's a huge difference between climate change occurring in a world full of kind of competition, and relative equality versus one that's occurring under fragmentation and inequality. I've been doing quite a lot of work with a historian by the name of John Halden. His kind of big pet theory is that climate change is only leading to collapse when it usually coincides with a polity that has high levels of inequality. That is something that seems to breed fragility and vulnerability. And he has a number of different case studies, including the Bison of the Empire to kind of buttress this scenario. And then finally, we have to kind of find a way to model all this together. I think as Goody mentioned, the kind of worst, worst case is when you actually have the worst case across all those four, both the Earth system response, the human response, as well as both the magnitude and the uh, rate of warming. Cool, there's some references and I'm very much looking forward to this exceedingly depressing discussion. <laughs>
Luke, thank you very much indeed. Um, if those of you who are participating, please do put your questions forward. Um, we would love to be able to ask the panel to answer the questions that you've had at the end of this very thought provoking and sobering um, set of discussions. But if I can actually take us away um, from the detail of the science for a moment, we will come back to that. Um, and look at some, you, you've each separately and slightly differently touched on the human dimension of this. And I'm going to start off by taking us completely away from the science and into mythology. Almost all of us, I'm sure, have come across the, um, the mythology of Pandora's box and that the last thing that humanity needed to be in the box to survive was hope. So I want to throw back to you at the end um, of what you have set out today, which is, as you say, extremely sobering. Where does this leave us in terms of hope? You've separately touched on um, how complex a system human psychology is, let alone human psychology at the level um, of a society, a country or the globe. But what do we do as humans with what you have just presented? And I'd love to hear a little bit more from each of you about where you see your responsibilities lying as both scientists but also um, those who are contributing to something that matters to all of us. Perhaps if I could start with Luke. I was hoping it wouldn't start with me since that's a huge <laughs> question and kind of worthy of some reflection. So when we think of tipping points, as Tim kind of mentioned, it's not just simply about negative tipping points, which we often tend to focus on, Tom, but also positive tipping points. So. I have a number of colleagues like um, you know, Otto at the Potsdam Institute who focuses more upon positive tipping points, the fact that you can often have nonlinear responses from society. And you see this all the way from things like dietary change through to social mobilization, social movements. And it's worthwhile remembering that most of the kind of biggest improvements we've had when it comes to things like civil rights have happened often in very short periods of time and often have happened for this kind of nonlinear effect. And for me, that's where I often hold the greatest degree of hope is that a lot of this is thinking about the worst case is predicated on, as mentioned, thinking about us not getting our act together when it comes to decarbonization and emissions, and also us not responding appropriately, responding through things like conflict rather than cooperation. And I think when we realize that we have this vast capacity for changing our social arrangements, often quite dramatically and quite quickly, particularly in response to a crisis, that gives me a fair bit of hope that we can potentially both decarbonize much more quickly than we're expecting and also respond in a much more pro-social way than the worst case would suggest. Thank you, Luke. Tim. Yeah, Luke's taken the words out of my mouth a little mm. bit because this is why I approach today's panel with some trepidation, Catherine and all, because every talk I give now is at least 50% on the positive tipping points we need to avoid the climate tipping points, if not more weighted two thirds to the positive tipping points and one third to the bleak message. Because, I, I, you know, I've learned a little bit about, about uh, human psychology and how we respond to different messages. And I think like, like you suggest with your question, it's, it's absolutely essential to convey that this complex systems view of the world is the thing that leaves us at least with the door ajar with some light coming through and the chance of, of escaping the worst. Um, and it, that can actually be a, an empowering message because if, if we can explain it uh, at least to our audience, um, we know that the that even humble phytoplankton cells once completely transformed the world and made an unbreakable atmosphere for us. So this whole conception of the possibility of positive tipping points should give us back a sense of autonomy and agency that we can do something uh, that really could trigger reinforcing feedback so we can have a real measurable difference in the, in the face of what is otherwise a frankly terrifyingly enormous problem where we often get in a mental logjam where we think, well, I could do something, but if X, where X is usually Chinese people or some other imagined other don't do anything, then it won't matter. Well, that, that isn't necessarily true. So yeah, that's precisely the angle I take. And if I can't convince myself that way, which I can at the moment, then the other path philosophically for me, which might not be to the taste of much of the audience, is through 
wider identification with nature. I mean, I'm a um, card carrying um, researcher on the Gaia hypothesis. I believe all living things have agency just as we do. They're every, all living things are trying to create their own conditions for flourishing in this complex interconnected system. And if we, you know, fail uh, to live up to our name of homo sapiens, sapiens, you know, intelligent people, then so be it. We, we just have to take that on the chin. But if you can identify with a wider life process, it sounds very Taoist or Zen Buddhist, then there's still a light there for me. I know it seems an, almost anti-humanist, but yeah, that's my take on it. Thank you, Tim. And Goodwin. Those are great, Tim. It's nice to have more sources of hope. Um, so I thought of a few when you asked the question. I, I've had a little bit of time to think about it. Um, one, one is just we manage, sometimes we do manage global crises like these, like the ozone situation. So that was an easier one because it was easier to deal with the hydrofluorocarbons. But we do have pretty amazingly strong international negotiation powers. Um, I guess, Catherine, you probably have that context mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that even just the mechanisms we're doing at the moment, they have they have surprising power. Um, but more, maybe more profoundly, I think um, issues like climate change are the CO2 emissions. We didn't know this would be the case when we set out um, with the Industrial Revolution. And we had both the progress that happened from the Industrial Revolution and the inadvertent situation of climate change emerge. So here we're left up dealing, left dealing with a really impossible mess, but it's from this kind of human desire to also improve things. Um, and so I think there's something actually kind of hopeful if we take into account all the good we've gotten from this fossil fuel caper, and we put that in proportion with the difficulty of the repairs that are needed. Um, and society, society contains people who are willing to die for things they believe in. I mean, that's not the thing we need to do here with climate change, but we, we do as a species have this kind of ability to enter a situation with moral, moral strength when we need to. And that also gives me a lot of hope. I mean, climate change has gone to strange places in terms of the debate and the believing and not believing. But if, if we could get beyond those, um, there is a lot of reason to believe that humans have strength to do difficult things for each other. Um, and then the last one, there isn't necessarily, we don't know of a particular moment when it's too late. And so every, because CO2 sticks around in the atmosphere for so long, every unit that you emit or I emit or anyone doesn't emit is a unit that doesn't exist, that isn't emitted then for the next 10,000 years. And so, um, while we're while we're doing these buying time steps now, while we're waiting for the, the system to bring itself together, every little bit of fossil fuels that we can not emit is going to put us in a better position when we get to net, net zero in the future. So those are some little angles that give me a little bit of hope. Thank you very much, um, Goodwin. There are a few um, detailed questions that have come in uh, focused on uh, Tim's presentation to start off with. So Tim, I wondered if for uh, the benefit of the wider audience, one of them is um, how soon could the AMOC tip into its shutdown phase and how long would it take for catastrophic impacts to be felt if it does? And then another one is when is the OECD report Tim referenced due to be published? Tim. So I'll do the easy second question, which is I think we were finalising a figure today under pressure because it must be going to the printers tomorrow. So it'll be out before COP26, that report. Um, it's, we're just one part of chapter, whatever it is, but at least at least this message is in there. Coming back to that Atlantic overturning circulation collapse, it happens in some of the IPCC models and it happens at different levels of global warming. Here I'm actually referring to the, the previous generations of models. So if anyone knows the lingo, the acronym is CMIT5. In those models, um, the model uh, in some of the models, it can happen at around two degrees of warming. But I have to tell you, the IPCC have said repeatedly that they think that it's unlikely that an AMOC collapse could be triggered and unfold within this century. So I should be absolutely clear, I differ. My view differs from that. 
partly based on some of their models, but they, you know, when they see it happen in one or two or three of 26 models, they say, well, it's unlikely. <laughs> I say, well, it could happen and we need it on the radar. So yes, it could happen at two degrees C in the in, in if you if you were to trust those models, and we can discuss the fact that those models have weaknesses and they might be bias stable. Um, if it does happen, that, that corresponds to about the middle of this century on the current warming trajectory in about, you know, 2040 to 2050 to 2060, give or take. How quickly could it unfold? Well, the past climate record shows us abrupt shifts um, in climate associated with this overturning circulation that essentially unfold in a decade. But the models, they take longer to break the overturning. So again, the models might have some flaws. They may be too stable. It may be that what happened in the past climate record was a couple of phenomena that we're not fully capturing. The changes in the ocean triggered changes in the faster systems, the atmosphere and the sea ice. Um, but the worst case would be, yeah, it gets triggered in the 2040s because we've got high warming, high climate sensitivity. And we looked at a scenario where it unfolded over sort of 20, 30 years within this century because I felt that was reasonable given what we know from Earth's recent history. So it would be with, in my in my scenario, it's plausible it could happen this century. I'm not I'm going to hang my hat on how likely I think that is or not. Um, but you can press me on that in the Q and A if you want. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Do any other panel members want to come back on anything that Tim has said before we move on to some other questions? No, in which case, moving on to another question we received, which is, there's a prediction that humanity will be devastated in 25 years due to phytoplankton loss. They're predicting in this research a tipping point when ocean acidity reaches 7.95 in the early 2040s, and then that all marine life and plankton based on carbonate dissolve, dissolves along with the loss of all whales and fish, that's a quote, leading to runaway climate change. Does this sound like a realistic scenario and are they right in thinking that eliminating plastic and chemi chemical pollution could restore health to phytoplankton quickly, helping them mitigate CO2 emissions and keep the oceans alkaline? So I'll have another go, shall I? <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's not, not as described a realistic scenario. It's, it's it, uh, funny for me to be accusing other people of alarmism, you might think, but this does not scientifically sound as stated. I mean, it would be a catastrophe for marine life if we have acidification to the point that it is killing off all calcifying organisms, but that would not be killing off all marine life. I can't remember the exact fraction of phytoplankton production that would be calcifiers. It would include eukaryotic algae, coccolithophores, if you have any inkling what they are, but it wouldn't be hurting diatoms that make salacious cells that are also algae, and it wouldn't be helping, it wouldn't be hurting the cyanobacteria, which produce about 50% of marine primary production and don't calcify. So it's wrong on those fronts. Um, and as for the plastics, well, we've got empirical evidence that microplastic particles in, are being eaten by zooplankton, which are little animals to you and I. Um, and for sure, that is not good news because they can't digest them. And then everything else above them in the food chain is not going to like that uh, problem for the zooplankton. But it's wrong to say that the microplastics are an obvious risk to the phytoplankton, the primary producers. I'm not aware of a great body of empirical evidence to say that the plastics easily or directly harm the primary producers. But suffice to say, these are serious issues. Um, and then in the question, there was something about this, uh, this group is saying that it'll cause runaway climate change. Well, no, even if you could collapse the biological pump in the ocean, you would release carbon from the deep ocean. You'd, you'd sort of, there's a disequilibrium at the moment where all this pumping of carbon down is concentrating in the deep ocean. But the amount you'd release would raise the atmospheric CO2 level by about 200 parts per million. That's bad news. Um, but it's not runaway, uh, not unless you kick in other feedbacks. It's just a constraint, what we call a constrained positive feedback, not a good one or bad things. But but we must, I think we, if we're scientists, we've got to be scientific about this. So that's what I tried to do there. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Tim. And we've got two slightly different questions that have come in about um, actions that we could take. So the first is Dr. Gibbons seemed to want to rule out our solar radiation management, which one could imagine being used to give humanity more time for a period of net carbon dioxide removal. Maybe my, my, I misunderstood. What do the panelists think? I'm also going to come in with the second question because I think they both speak to the same area, which is what are the actions that we could take? And then I think perhaps speaking to what um, Dr. Gibbons was focusing on, should we take them? The second is I work with a group advocating what we call the climate triad, accelerated emission uh, reductions, massive greenhouse gas removal of trillions of tons, including methane, and directed cooling, perhaps iron salt aerosols or marine cloud brightening and refreezing the Arctic as ways to get temperatures increases to well below one degree C to ultimately restore a safe climate. Your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Goodwin, do you want to start? Yes, um, I do want to make sure I'm giving a more balanced view on this. Um, part of the issue is this concept of a safe climate and also like a, a safe long term after the usage of solar radiation management. So um, just to give a little bit of a background on the science that makes me concerned, the fundamental thing is that um, the sort of two knobs that change the energy balance of the climate. There's the outgoing long wave radiation and the incoming solar radiation. And when we change the greenhouse gases, we're turning the long wave knob. And the idea of solar radiation management is to twist the short wave knob. And the issue here is that um, they, are not, they are not opposite from each other. So this point about the triad, accelerated emissions reductions is a direct counter to the emissions that we're producing. That's a simple win. There's not a problem with reducing reducing our CO2 emissions, there isn't a possible negative consequence. Um, well, that's not, that's not entirely true, but the, the, the chance of a negative consequence is much less. Um, whereas uh, solar radiation management just carries this innate riskiness. Um, things that might happen is that the, the, like the precipitation pattern or the, the ability for crops to grow, um, the pattern of warming, the, the cycling of warming throughout the day. These are things that are climate changes, but maybe not global warming that can happen when you do solar radiation management to combat climate change. Not to mention issues with um, what happens when you stop doing the solar radiation management. Does the climate respond very quickly? Um, and uh, you know, how are other things happening like the ocean acidification that are not directly related to the warming? So. Um, there might, I don't want to say that there isn't a scenario where solar radiation management is better than the alternative, um, but it's a dangerous thing to put in place. And I think, um, I think that goes to answering both questions. Maybe we can talk about um, the removal of tr trillions of tons, including methane, depending on the mechanism, maybe is, is not such a scary thing because it's reversing the, the I mean, if you're removing CO2, then that's just reversing the emission of CO2. So that's my, my sort of prior, I would say, on the solar radiation management issue. Um, used carefully might not be, might be part of a solution, but is dangerous. Um, I'm really curious to hear what the other panelists would say though. Um, let's, let's pass it off. <laughs> Tim, you've unmuted yourself and then we'll go to Luke. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, Goody made a lot of important points there. I mean, my broad brushstroke take on this is um, solar radiation management, as it's glibly called, could be of an equivalent level of riskiness to the risk you're trying to avoid. So it doesn't sound to me like a particularly sane risk management strategy to, <laughs> to introduce a poorly understood, potentially similarly risky intervention to fend off um, a known, a sort of known, partly known risk. I think what we're learning, you know, by seeing those questions come up is that if we choose to shine a light on tipping points and extreme climate impact scenarios, we are necessarily inviting ourselves to think about how on earth can we stop that? And we are necessarily inviting this discourse about solar sunlight reflection methods, as I rather would prefer to call them. So let me try to add a little bit in terms of why, why do I think we could get that badly wrong or it could be dangerous? Well, first, you know, when we were uh, emitting aerosols into the Northern Hemisphere troposphere in the 70s, we now know that that was contributing to the profound drought in the Sahel. We can all remember the 84 famine and so on and so forth. So if you don't 
you know, there's a simple case where we know if you didn't evenly distribute aerosols at whatever altitude in the atmosphere, you can really cause serious impacts in, for, in parts of the world with many people. On top of that, you have the geopolitical point that uh, many people reflecting on this would think that if Pakistan or India thought that India had disrupted the monsoon because they'd done some stratospheric aerosol injection or vice versa, both nuclear armed states might, it might heighten tensions between them and who, who's to say whether it wouldn't provoke conflict that's been, we've all, well, many of, well, has been borderline for a long time. So that's, but there was a broader point from an earth system point of view is, We've heard from Luke how we don't know what the climate sensitivity is. Now, my biggest beef with the would-be solar radiation managers is they're still operating in this sort of modernist mentality of a mechanistic universe where they think we do know fully how the Earth system works and we kind of do know the climate sensitivity and therefore we know how much aerosol to inject. The point here is you have to inject quite a lot to get a signal above the noise to actually be able to demonstrate that you've had an effect. If you're unlucky and you you stick quite a lot in, but it does turn out we're in a high climate sensitivity world, well, then you're just running the risk of overcooling the system, right? <laughs> um, I probably made more than enough points there. I, I could go on a, a painful length on this topic as to why, basically, I think philosophically it's flawed to, <laughs> to introduce... This, this completely different kind of intervention in a, into a complex system that we have to be totally honest, we don't fully understand, um, in, with thinking hubristically that, that it's going to uh, cancel out um, the greenhouse forcing. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Luke? This is a very juicy topic. So luckily, one of my PhD students back at the Australian National University, Aaron Tang, is doing some wonderful work on geoengineering, both solar radiation management and negative emissions. So first of all, negative emissions, I agree with both Goody and Tim that this is the less dangerous and probably more benevolent option when we look at large scale interventions into the Earth system. The problem with negative emissions is first of all, there are trade-offs still. So if you're looking at really large scale bio energy carbon capture and storage decks, or even really large scale direct air capture, it's likely gonna require in very large amounts of land as well. So there was at least one study, I think back in 2019, which suggested that in order to meet a fairly low level of carbon capture, you're probably looking at something like the size of India in terms of arable land. Um, which obviously is going to have a large competition when it comes to things like food security, et cetera. And secondly, and this is for me the much larger one, is feasibility. The, one of the articles that Aaron did was looking at the rate of change for different large scale kind of industrial or energy system changes. And these tend to take, even once you have the technology coming to market and taking up roughly 25% of the market share, they still take somewhere between kind of half to a full century to occur. And right now, when it comes to negative emissions, none of these technologies are deployed at scale. And the idea that we can have these deployed at a really large scale and potentially have something that is equivalent to the fossil fuel industry being created in the space of, you know, 70 years or less, potentially possible, but it seems like it's resting on pretty heroic assumptions. So I think there's very large question marks about how much negative emissions can actually contribute to the climate response. Solar radiation management is the kind of more dangerous and interesting one. And what I want to focus upon here is one particular form of solar radiation management called stratospheric aerosol injection, which is where you pop up aerosols, essentially cooling agents into the atmosphere. This is one of the most attractive options because it's believed it can be done at a fairly low cost in terms of just billions of dollars. And it could be also unilaterally deployed by a single actor, whether it's a billionaire or a potential state. An article that Aaron and I just finished, which has been accepted with Frontiers and should be published in the coming months, is called Worse Than Warming, where we essentially try to actually look at what are the worst cases of kind of stratospheric aerosol injection. And we use this framework that I put up before one of the slides of looking at both the aggregate impacts, systemic risk, latent risk, and also its ability to trigger other extreme risks. In short, we don't really know too much. It's a very neglected area of study. Both Tim and Goody mentioned that we do know it's likely to change precipitation patterns. 
it's also interestingly likely to change the range of different vector borne diseases as well as invasive species. So we can probably expect potentially new zoonotic infections emerging if it is used. We also do know it's going to change temptation patterns, which can have knock on effects in terms of the agricultural system. We, at this stage, really don't know if it could have direct impacts in terms of causing some kind of large scale tipping point, which Tim, Tim mentioned, but we can't rule that out either. And it's worth remembering here that most of the models are done with the assumption that this is deployed in a fairly kind of perfect manner by a single global rational agent. In reality, of course, this is not going to happen, and we could very easily see different countries trying to compete and micromanage their own regional climates. And on top of that, you could also potentially have something like a super volcanic kind of eruption occur, or even a nuclear war, which would actually pump up more coolants and kind of heighten the risk that you push a tipping point the other way. So that's that. But basically, our main conclusion was the biggest risk when it comes to geoengineering or stratospheric aerosol injection is latent risk that even if it works perfectly, you still essentially just masking a certain level of warming. And we're most likely to use geoengineering straight stroke aerosol injection when it comes to large levels of warming. It's gonna be used in a set escape course most likely. And if you're hiding, you know, two degrees, three degrees or even more of warming, there's this problem of termination shock that warming that could occur over the space of decades up to even a century is likely to occur over the space of roughly nine to 12 months instead. So that's obviously going to change the challenges associated with warming if all of a sudden warming that we expect to, um, to occur is happening in like magnitude, sorry, what is magnitude faster? And this is a real problem we foresee is that if geoengineering is used, it's used to cover a large amount of warming and in some way that system is knocked out whether it be just due to something like a solar flare, large scale war, nuclear war, et cetera, essentially have a much larger climatic response. All the warming comes rushing back in. So we kind of frame it as this planetary sword Democles hanging overhead. And it, in a way, it's just a kind of shifting of the risk distribution where your kind of median scenario, if the system plays and stays in place is quite good. If it gets knocked out, all of a sudden these kind of extinction level scenarios become much more plausible. We can't hear you, you're muted, Catherine. Absolutely right, sorry, there was some noise outside, so I muted myself. We've had another question come in. Um, addressing climate change and avoiding negative tipping points appears to require major changes in human, human behavior at scale. Yet human opinions seem to be very polarized. Is anyone factoring this into the probabilities of achieving even modest climate goals? Tim. Oh. Great, great question. There's there's a bit of work on it, but probably not enough would be a good answer. Um, it, this actually connects us back to the discussion about um, positive tipping points or social tipping points, because they are sort of framed around the often in, around the idea that you have critical mass effects where if a certain fraction of a population adopts the new norm or behavior or possibly product or technology then you, you the critical mass is where one more person adopting will tip all the others to follow um, trying to interface that with a polarization might seem unintuitive but uh, sometimes you're in a situation where you have clusters of the population in the one camp or the other and it doesn't preclude that you can't have a, a shift to one extreme or the other that's more of a mass shift but yeah a very very interesting reflection and many of us are, i'm sure are troubled by the sort of uh, the flight i was going to call it the flight from rationality without want to flatter wanting to flatter rationality too much but let's let's put it this way i am troubled i am troubled by uh anti-vaxxers by um yeah apparent pop popular movements that just seem to turn away from fairly solid evidence and science on certain issues, whatever those issues are. If that's the trend that continues, um, then my the door that was showing a little bit of a chink of light that we could get our stuff together on a problem as complex as climate change is, is frankly going to close. close. <laughs> so yeah, fantastic question, really. Um, 
there's a little bit of work that uses so-called agent-based models, which would actually literally try to represent this polarization, and, and a little bit of work that some of us do on, on sort of network theory and analysis, analysis of social media data to actually track this polarization in discourses and the like. Um, it often is perceived bad. We, if we discussed it some more, we might also find cases where it doesn't have to be a bad thing, that we might even have it to our advantage in the great transformation. But but yeah, I think I probably share the question as uh, worries about it. And Goodwin, as you set out in your explanation of your own journey, you're now in a, um, a faculty of philosophy. What are your thoughts about this question? Actually, I would say, um, I think my thoughts come from my experience of being a scientist as well. Um, I was a scientist studying a kind of niche area, kind of like Tim, I was studying a theory of um, self-organization of the climate, which is not the normal way that climate scientists study um, the climate, which is normally through these big models. Um, and I was privileged during that to also get to speak to some people who are very much on the polarized other end of the spectrum. Um, so sometimes skepticism in one arena might be well placed, but it gets mapped to skepticism and something that it doesn't quite apply to. And so I have a bit of a, um, a sense of hope that there is more common ground in the center than we're taking advantage of right now. So part of the reason that the debate on climate change has become polarized is because the people on, um, on the side of climate action also are pulling, are pulling the situation maybe wider than, um, than is then it's palatable to the people we need to work with across the aisle. Um, what I suppose I'm trying to say is, it seems to me that the basic, um, the basic elements of the climate change problem are, are solid and that we should be able to build more cohesiveness around it. I see there's another question that come up, came up. I might invoke the next question that um, someone's asked about. For example, suppose um, we're looking at the, uh, maybe a, a more right or um, motivation to, to not have migrants into a country. That's something that I think most people who are um, climate activists are not of that political persuasion at all. Um, but that is a, pl uh, a value from which you might consider action on climate change. How do we deal with, um, how do we deal with being a team on the issue of climate change, whereas we might not be a team with some of our other social values. Um, and that I think that there is simple, science in the middle of this that doesn't need us to take on um, too many things that are politically divisive might be a safe place to come back to to decrease the polarization on this issue. Um, I hope that made sense. I think I man didn't manage to. I haven't delivered that point often. It's not a question I often get asked, but it's definitely um, the science that we do have at the center of this, that CO2 increases the, the temperature, that the earth is a crazy place that we don't understand, um, and that this is scary. It's just so um, so far from all the pieces that have come into the polarizing debate that it feels promising to return to the basics. Tim looks concerned, so I'm curious what he's thinking. Maybe he's not. I know I'm I'm frowning because I'm trying to trying to address also the question in the chat about is it legitimate to talk about the climate refugees triggered by climate change scenario um, as a way of motivating the right wing who are fairly xenophobic to come on board with the climate <laughs> issue, which is a killer question from Stephen. Um, I'm not frowning at you, sorry, Goody. I, might, I don't know if I should carry on with my answer, but I'm- I might here. quickly jump in before we head on to that yeah, question. I think that. It's, a, it's a very important one. Um, <laughs> So first of all, like Tim, I'm not aware of any modeling, which actually tries to integrate in kind of epistemic belief patterns with mitigation efforts. It, it may exist, but it's not that I've come across. I want to give both kind of reasons for optimism and reasons for pessimism when it comes to this. So first of all, reasons for optimism is that it may be a bit of a red herring that when you look at polling data across a large number of different countries, including countries that are usually considered to be quite recalcitrant in climate action, countries like my own, Australia, as well as the US, most people are actually pretty supportive of both climate action as well as surprisingly high levels of carbon pricing. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to impact the way they vote, which is a, a different certain matter. And when you actually let people, even if they're quite polarized, deliberate in a structured process, whether it be in for an assembly or a jury, a thing we call deliberate democracy, they tend to come to surprisingly good conclusions. We have a whole bunch of both theoretical and practical examples. 
one recent one was actually in Paris where in response to the Yellow Vest uh, riots, Macron organized a climate change assembly, the French climate change assembly. And this had, I think roughly 150 people come together over this space around about a year to discuss and deliberate over what would be an adequate and appropriate climate response. And they ended up coming up with over a hundred different recommendations, which together formed a very comprehensive and very ambitious policy package. And the problem was that Macron only accepted three of those, despite having agreed prior to um, accepting all of them. And I think this is just, to me, the biggest problem is not polarization right now, it's the, the fossil fuel lobby and the political economy of climate change. So that's one reason for optimism. Reason for pessimism, very, very briefly, is that there's some emerging evidence that one of the problems and drivers of polarization is wealth inequality. So there's some really good exa examples of this in the US where you use some people actually mapped out the number of bipartisan bills being put forward as well as voting across the floor in the US. And you see it slowly splitting apart between the Democrats and Republicans, and that maps almost perfectly onto the in, uh, sorry, increase in wealth inequality within the US. And the downside to this, of course, is that we can expect wealth inequality to probably increase going into the future. A very influential book in this area is called The Great Leveler by Walter Scheidel, where he tries to do a deep history of wealth inequality. And his fairly depressing conclusion is that it always increases inexorably until you have a great level of mass mobilization, warfare, a state collapse, a pandemic, or a bloody revolution. And so at least for the foreseeable future, we can probably expect wealth inequality to increase both within countries, particularly in countries, and for that to drive further polarization. So that's both kind of Good points, it's potentially red herring, and bad points, it's probably going to get worse going into the future. So we're coming towards the end and we've got a whole constellation of questions that are all nibbling at the same point, which Tim and Goodwin, you've begun to touch on. So there's the question that we've already raised, the excellent question about, um, given that this needs to be an a global movement and a whole of society movement, what are the ethics around how we engage different constituencies in this debate with different messages? There's also a question that's come in around national differences, even in societies which we might consider to be fairly similar at another level. So looking at the response to climate um, in the UK, for example, versus the response to the US. And then there's a question which actually looks back into history um, and brings together the fact that around um, the Second World War, uh, there was a very high degree of mobi uh, global mobilization around an issue. So I'm going to, because we haven't, we've only got 10 minutes left and I do want to give the panelists an opportunity to have a final word. Maybe in um, the next five minutes, if each of you could look at that constellation of issues um, from whichever you think is most pertinent and powerful, to your research. But I think the fundamental point is, this is a global problem. Um, how do we mobilize most effectively um, a global answer? Goodwin, perhaps if I could start with you first, in part because you were talking very interestingly, I thought, about the power of this framing questions of what we value. Thank you, yes. Um, and it's also particularly interesting, this US-UK division as a dual national myself and having spent time in both of these countries. So um, I've noticed in the US that when people need to make up their mind about climate change, often they check in with their religious values and make up their mind about abortion first. And based on their feelings about abortion as a, as a right versus a crime, um, they find that they have to take a certain stance on climate change. And to me, like I was trying to say before, that, um, that wrapping up of something so simple and universal um, that really should appeal to people with different constituencies, people with different values as our common substrate, our common landscape, that isn't an issue that belongs only to the left. The fact that that's wrapped up with these other political debates, which are maybe more open for political debate than climate changes, seems, um, seems really concerning. And I think thinking about world wars, there was something very... Um, unifying about having your whole country a threat. I mean, whether or not you valued this church or that church within your country, if your country was not going to exist, you could get on board with that. And so um, 
I, I feel like a, a releasing of the issue to more common ground, allowing it to belong to people from different values and different backgrounds and being able to say, well, you know, I didn't get there from the same values, but I'm glad we got to the same conclusion on this issue. Um, feels to me like the only way um, to do this collectively. Um, and that feels really, really important because this isn't something that we need, one side can do for the other side um, that will result in too much resentment and upheaval, I think. Um, so that's, that's sort of my feeling, separate it from these maybe more um, legitimate political differences. Thank you, Goodwin. Luke or Tim, do you have any thoughts on this wider ethical and you know, how do we concert as countries or indeed the world? Mm. I could. I was read a brilliant piece yesterday about this. I will need to re remember the author to credit them properly. But it was what we're looking at with climate change, the classic kind of potential tragedy of the commons, common poor resource situation where we all sort of reap the benefits if we limit climate change, and we all, to varying degrees, carry the costs if we don't. But then tackling climate change is also the, the costs of doing so and the benefits are also unequally distributed. So one has to get oneself in a sort of strategic mindset of, okay, if we embrace the transformation, if we accept the argument that we just can't afford to go to a two degree, let alone three degree sea warmer world, if we could come to, together on that, then we've still got to answer the question of, okay, how to make the transformation happen in a just way, so on the one hand, you have the gilet jaune, as, as Luke mentioned. So essentially, one side of the problem is if you're, you know, some initial costs to trying to trigger the transition are hitting the pockets of the poorest people or poorer people in society, they will rebel. So we have to have a, re, a sensible thought out um, redistribution strategy to not to nullify that, to not penalise the poorer in society. That's sort of transparently obvious perhaps, but not so transparently obvious that the French got it right the first time, let's put it that way. <laughs> now on the other side of the coin, you'd think, well, why worry about the rich people? But the problem is some of the rich people are standing to lose here. They're the CEOs of the fossil fuel companies or whatever. And there's a different dynamic to work out how to win um, against them. Now, part of this is about a coalition of those of us in the middle ground who are on a partly, you would call, could argue a moral quest here to, to, to make the transformation happen. Um, we certainly have to come together um, to, to tip the dynamic away from rich vested interests in the current status quo. That's perhaps another statement of the blindingly obvious. Um, but we might even, unfortunately, in some cases, even have to think about, he heaven forbid, that we shouldn't really morally be thinking about having to compensate in any sense the rich that stand in the way. So I, I'd rather not go there. But it is clear that it needs subtle thinking to work out how to, to win over the, the very strong rich vested interests that have been standing against progress on this existential matter for, for most of my lifetime. So I don't know if those reflections help. I'll try and um, find and put in the chat the, the piece I was enjoying that uh, articulated this better than I could. <laughs> Tim, thank you very much. We've got four minutes left. And so to wrap up, what I'd really like to do is thank you to all our questioners. Um, and thank you also for taking us through some detailed science and into these broader ethical and societal questions. But I want to turn us back into the science in the last four minutes. And perhaps if I could ask each of our panelists to say, um, from the scientific start of this conversation, what is the one fact, message or piece of research that you would like all of us to go away remembering? Tim, maybe if I could start with you. Mm. Uh, the, t the take home message is we are in a climate emergency. And if you're in an emergency, 
you should be acting urgently to do something about uh, lowering the risk of the existential risk you're running. Um, so I suppose the take home, and then the other the other side of the take home message is we all have some agency in that in this to to be part of that urgent action. It's not good enough to sort of point the finger at the government, uh, poor though they often are. Um, let's take matters into our own hands. Uh, sorry, that's not a reference to mm -hmm. one study, but <laughs> that's my honest mm -hmm. view. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Goodwin. That is not an easy question, but it's a nice one. I think. But agreeing with everything Tim said, and to add another one, um, of those list of four ways that we could hit a worst case, the two that we have most control over is the amount of CO2 that we emit and the way that we are prepared to adapt to this year, the changing of the climate in terms of the human impact. And so keeping a focus on those two priorities, um, mitigation and adaptation as being the two things that we know we need to be working on whether or not we're waiting for further updates to the details of the science that will come in the future IPCC reports. Thank you, Goodwin. And Luke? Yeah, to echo both Tim and Goodwin, we are in a crisis and we don't know how bad it could get. That should not be grounds for complacency, but for precaution. And understanding and thinking through the worst cases can lead us both to better risk management, but also to hopefully responding in a much more coherent, cooperative and better fashion. Um, and just one very, very brief, quick answer to the previous question we were discussing, uh, plugging some work I did with uh, Rebecca Colvin back at the ANU. We do know that if you have picked the right messenger and if you avoid ideological bundling and you choose the right frame, you can find ways to actually appeal to vast ways of audiences and avoid polarization. Um, this is all kind of common lessons from social psychology and communication. And I think that when it comes to getting broad cooperation, a lot of this is also about talking about the positive, in particular co-benefits. The, the big, really positive story of the science over the last couple of decades has been an emerging picture that we should be trying to decarbonize even if it was for climate change, right? purely due to things like reducing the health costs of greenhouse gases. There's a really, really compelling reason that decarbonizing is building a better world, even if we are concerned about climate change. Thank you very much indeed, Luke. So thank you again to our panelists, to um, Professor Tim Lenton, Dr. Goodwin Gibbons, and Dr. Luke Kemp, uh, particularly Luke for bringing together um, this panel. And a final thank you to Cambridge Zero's Climate Change Festival 2021, and to all of you for joining us. Um, Luke, I think you ended with three bullet points, and as a former diplomat, one should always end with three, um, that the reason this matters is because we need better risk management better coherence and better cooperation. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks everyone.